I am too. Well, I don't know if it's technical because I have to see if it works. All right, so this chapter is about the normal model. So this is from chapter 6, if you're going to be reading about this in the textbook from chapter 6. And we're going to be talking about this all week. And it's a very important chapter because it leads into a lot of stuff we're going to do in the second semester. All right, so make sure if you want to read chapter 6, you read it on your own. Let's begin. So the first thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about something called a standardized value. All right, now this standardized value will allow us to compare things that have different units or are from different groups. All right, so the reason this is so helpful, because you may have heard in the past the phrase, you can't compare apples to oranges. You guys ever heard of that phrase before? What's up? Well, I know, I'm just, I'm just, that's a phrase. It's like comparing apples to oranges. The phrase means that they're two different things, so you can't compare them. Um, you don't want to know. I mean, I don't, but I want to do the lesson. Right? I am recording. Right, so Natalie, Tyree, Diana, just inter interrupting us. That's okay for those for those watching at home. Okay, <laughs> let's go live. So for the standard deviation as a ruler, the idea is we can use our knowledge of the mean and the standard deviation to standardize these data values. So I want you to think about when we do this later today, we're not changing the data. We're not changing the data. All we're doing is taking the units away. Okay? So the reason we're doing it is so we can compare it to things that are different. If we standardize both groups, Diana, then we can compare the two. But I thought you couldn't compare oranges with manzanas. Well, okay. Uh, well, well, you can compare naranjas with manzanas because you can standardize both. The phrase is. Well, you can't do that. You can't compare to apples to oranges. You can in statistics. Wow. I know. Thank you. That was my first wow of the day. All right. So the formula I want you to see here, I put here on, the, on your paper. This is the formula we're going to use in the examples today, where z is your standardized z-score. So that's called a z-score. It's equal to your data value, whatever your data value is, y, minus y bar. That's how you read that y bar, y bar, that's the mean, this is the mean, and s is your standard deviation, s is your standard deviation. So we're going to subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. Yes, Natalie? Why have, oh, sorry, uh, I know like we read about it, but like I still don't understand when it's a z score, z score. Like, so, yeah. What is a z score, z score? Yeah, like what, are there like qualifications or is it just like, that's yeah, so there are properties of z-scores, like z-scores don't have any units, oh. and it's always about how many standard, devi standard deviations they are above or below the mean. That's the z-score. Oh, okay. So like, think of it like this. I always like going back to this. Pablo, you with us? Come on, Pablo. Thank you. When we first talked about the age in our class, right, there is a mean. If I wanted to standardize each of your ages, I would take your age, subtract the mean, and then divide by our standard deviation. You, you'd still be the same person, but instead of you being 17 years old, you now have a z-score associated with it. So it's not changing your data value, just the way I look at it. Okay, and then you would have a z-score that's above or below the mean. Yeah. I'm sorry, why is what is y bar is what is the mean? Well, you know that one. Y bar is the mean, and y is just any data value. Yeah, Pablo. No, it's the actual equation. So you would get a number that has no units. Okay. It's just how that number tells you how far above or below the mean. Everybody okay? Okay, here. I'm just going to go to the next slide because I think it'll help you guys a lot. A lot of these questions you're asking are all here. The idea being that 
When you standardize, all now you care about is whether it's above or below the average. I know, I know, but like my question was, if, are you ever going to give us a problem where you already gave us a C score and then you're like, find the value? Absolutely. <sighs> okay, that's called algebra. Mm, I missed that. Okay, I taught you that. I know. Ouch. Huh? I had oh, I thought you said you missed it. You missed it like you liked it. Okay, okay. we're good. We're good. I thought you meant like I missed that class. I was like, oh, that hurts. I taught you that. <laughs> so the idea here is that because I know some of you are asking, like, why are we doing this? The idea is that we can compare things. You're going to see we're going we're gonna to do an example between three Olympians Whoa. and their times on a running event, their uh, distance in the shot put and the long jump which are three very different events, but we can compare all of them once we standardize. We can see how far away from the mean they did, and that will help us determine who gets the gold medal, the silver medal, and the bronze medal, which is what they do in the Olympics, guys. When they have the decathlon, that's why they have the 10 events for one gold medal. That's what they do. They standardize everything. Cool, crazy. Okay, so like, when we're finding a Z-score, you're gonna get a set of numbers, and we're gonna have to Z-score everything. Well, there's, first off, if you're finding a C-score for more than one thing, I will be letting you use a computer. Right? The idea is if, I, if you find a Z-score for one data value, you should be able to do that algebra quickly. Right? You're just subtracting two numbers and dividing by a standard deviation. That's not that challenging. The question you're asking about, will you have data? Sometimes you'll have real data, and sometimes you'll have something called a model, which we're going to get to okay. at, like, later on in the lecture. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah. Now... The whole premise of this comes from the idea that if you take all of your data values and add or subtract a constant to them, stuff is going to change. All right, so this slide about shifting data says that if you add or subtract a number to all of your data values, your measures of center will change. Does anybody remember measures of center? No. Very good, Diana. That's exactly right. The mean and the median will change as well. But measures of spread will be unchanged. Measures of spread will be unchanged. What are some measures of spread? IQR, standard deviation, and then the range is also a measure of spread. All three of those will change. Think of it like this. Uh, we'll, sorry, we'll remain, uh, sorry, for those listening, that was my fault. Those will remain unchanged. Measure the spread, unchanged. Think of it like this. If I have quartile 3 minus quartile 1, what is this equal to? IQR. The IQR, okay? <laughs> if this is 10 minus 6, what is 10 minus 6? Four. 4. 4, great. So the IQR is 4. If I take all of the data values and I add 10 to them. So that means my quartile 3 becomes 20, and my quartile uh, 1 becomes 16. What is 20 minus 16? Still 4. So the IQR, which is a measure of spread, is unchanged. So measures of spread do not change when you add or subtract. Say it again. That measures of center do. Because if you take all your data values and you add them by 10, yeah, you have a new center. It's going to be 10 units. Nope, mean and median change. Range, standard deviation, IQR, do not. Now, the other way we can do this, the other way we can do this is to rescale the data by multiplying or dividing by a number. If we multiply or divide all of your data values by the same number, then you're going to change everything. Measures of center will change as well as measures of spread. So that idea that some things didn't change, that's not happening when you multiply or divide all of your data values by a constant. So everything changes. And we're going to do an example after these notes that hopefully hits this home for your brain. Now, I haven't really been mentioning it if you looked at the slides, but the previous slide had two histograms, and this slide also has two histograms. If you looked at the previous slide, you'll see how the shape is really no different. But on this slide, when we're multiplying or dividing, that's when the shape changes. Even if it's just a slight change, it still will change.
measures of center and measures of spread. So we have a new center, we have a new mean, we have a new median, and new spread. But it's the same IQR. Nope, IQR changes too. The only time things don't change, Pablo, is when you're only adding or subtracting. But when you multiply and divide. When you multiply or divide, everything changes. Uh, everything okay. changes. When you add or subtract, only measures of center change. Measures of center, that's mean and median, those change. Everything changes. Mm -hmm. Add or subtract, just measures of center change. Just the center changes for adding and subtracting. So wait, when you do that, when you're rescaling beta, are uh -huh. you like multiplying and dividing? When you say by that same constant value, are you talking about the z-score or are you talking about... No, I'm talking about the data. We'll talk about what happens when you do z-score things. Oh, okay. We'll get there, I promise. All right, back to z-scores. <laughs> so the reason I took that little like two-slide kind of sidebar, if you will, away from the notes, away from z-scores, is because when you looked at that formula of subtracting your data value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, that's all we're doing. We're taking all of your data values, <coughs> subtracting a constant, the mean, and dividing by the standard deviation. So we are shifting and rescaling to get the z-scores, to get the z-scores. So that's why it's in this chapter and why you read it on Friday, because the z-score formula is shifting and rescaling the data. All right, and ultimately the idea here is that once you have standardization, you have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So you have a new mean and a new standard deviation once you standardize. Any questions so far? All right, let's continue. Now, all of this is leading up to a model that you're going to see a lot in this course and you're going to see in other courses that you have in college. It's called the normal model. The first thing I want you to hear, and you're going to hear it over and over again, is that all models are wrong. All models are wrong. And I say that because models... I call them wrong because they're not going to line up with exactly what happens in the real life. For example, you guys know that there's a hurricane approaching the United States. Oh, really? No, not here. Not yet. Hopefully not for a long time. Okay? It's the Carolinas. South and North Carolina. Now, the reason, the reason that some counties in those states have already started to be evacuated is because of models. Now, the model that they're projecting, this hurricane, the route they're projecting to take, will that be exactly right? No. no. So is that model right? No. But is it useful? Yes. Yes, because after hundreds, hundreds of years of doing this and having the computing power for the last 25 years to do this, they can simulate millions of models and get the best idea of where that hurricane is going to go. Will it be perfect? No. But will it be useful? Absolutely. It will probably save someone's life. So the idea is that yes, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Some of them are useful. Why is the M like a factor of eight? Now, let's talk about some stuff up here. So the first thing, if I circle this, that capital N is telling you that it's a normal model. The capital N stands for a normal model. Now, whenever you have a normal model, you have two what we call parameters, the mu and the sigma. Those are Greek letters. Mu, mu. mu, uh huh, and sigma. I don't want, no, one, no one ever believes me when I write that. So mu and sigma. Now, these are just the Greek letters for our M 
and S. That's all they are. I know the one kind of looks like the M, and the other one, I think, Shally, you're looking at that. That doesn't look like S at all, but, you know, take it up with the Greeks. All right, so mu. And, all right, then. Mu and sigma. Mu and sigma. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm doing this. That's right. That led to this moment. All right. I thought you were going to say, have you heard of Athens? Because, like, that's in Greece. But no, have you heard of Little Caesars? Lexi. I like it. That was, that was Lexi. Okay. Oh my goodness. Such a train wreck. Yes, all my all my fifty five subscribers are really gonna enjoy this video. Subscribe. Okay. If you like this video, please please click on the link. I don't have that. <laughs> Pablo, are you still writing? Are you still writing? Okay. Now, you should notice we already looked at this equation. For the z squared, you see how we already looked at that one? Y minus y bar over s. But this one is different because if you're talking about a model, so we have this one for real data, this one for a model, then we're going to use the Greek letters mu and sigma for mean and standard deviation. Yes, I can. So the idea is when we have real data, Bashir, we're using this formula that I showed you, y minus y bar over s. That gives us a z score. It's the same formula, but when it's a model, not real data, we use the Greek letters, mu and sigma, for mean and standard deviation. So it's a little, a subtle change, but the, the uh, letters you use to represent your uh, mean and sigma, mean and standard deviation, they do matter. All right? The notation, thank you, there's the word. Jeez, brain, come on. The notation matters. Yes? So for the model formula and the real data formula, um, for the y minus uh, mu. The mu and the y minus the y bar, is the mu and the y bar, are they interchangeable or are they completely different? Good, good, good question from Natalie. I don't know if everyone heard that back there. She basically was asking, are they interchangeable? It's yes and no. Do they mean the same thing? <laughs> I mean the same thing as their means. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> they mean the same thing. They're both the mean. But it'd be like, I think of it like this. When it's a model, you're at school, you're wearing a uniform. When you're at home, real data, you're wearing a different whatever you're wearing. So it's, just, it's still you, but it's in a different way. Yeah. Still you, though. Still the mean, but one is real data, and you'll know. And the same for Sigma. Same for Sigma. Yeah. So, like, basically, moves, moves you know what it's meant to be. OK. <laughs> so basically, like, Think of mu and Sigma as more formal. <laughs> Informal. But they're the same thing, it's just when you use them. I'll, and we'll show you with examples about when to use both. Okay. Now, before you can do any of this stuff, you either need to be told by the problem that you're, you're okay to use a normal model, or you need to check that your real data has a shape that is unimodal and roughly symmetric. And we're not going to really do much of this during this chapter, but when we get into the second semester and we start using this again, you're going to see that we need to make a histogram with the real data to see if it's unimodal and roughly symmetric. And then we can go ahead and use the normal model. All right? But most of the problems that we do this week will say, assume a normal model. They'll tell you to use a normal model because they want you to practice with it. Correct. If it's the normal model, you should be using mu and sigma. 
Real data. We're going to use it in an example today. Stop whistling, please. Oh, okay. Shh. Stop. Shh. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely not for us right now. Thank you, though. Probably you. Okay, now, the last slide. Make sure you write all this down. So for the last slide on the 68.9599.7, the idea is, is that if you have a normal model, this can tell you a lot about how much of your data is going to be under this curve. All right? But sure you shouldn't be writing this. You're good. I know, it's a joke. Okay, so in the normal model, your mean is going to be right in the middle. Yes. So the mean of your data always has a z-score of zero, right? If you have your mean and subtract the mean, you get zero, okay? So the z-score for the mean is always zero. If you move one standard deviation above and one below, you will find approximately 68% of your data will fall between one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. So that means z-score of one and z-score of negative, negative one. If you do the same thing for two above and two below, that's now 95% of your data will fall between two and negative two for C scores. And finally, three above and three below is 99.7%. Now when I read that number, that's almost all the data. That's between three and negative three. So what if I found a Z score for you and your Z score was five? Then yours is five, negative five. What if your z-score was 5? Uh-huh. be 100. What if your z-score was 5? It'll be wider. I would say about your z-score that that is unusual. Because anything that's past 3 or negative 3, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It's just not likely that. It's unusual. Okay? So whatever you have is worth you would say that that's an unusual z-score. And I'm sure there'll be a question associated with what to do about it. All right? So kind of like that outlier stuff? Like it's like an sure, you could talk of it like that. It's kind of like the outlier stuff. You got it. All right, let's go ahead and do some problems. Yeah, I'm not ready. OK. Well, I had peacocking today, so there you go. Hurry, 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 hurry. Leave your phone, take the back. You're welcome. Do you know? Destiny? Whatever name you want to be called? Thank <laughs> you.